Welcome to World of DAS, a show for data enthusiasts. I'm your host, Warren Hoffman, CEO of SafeGraph and GP of Flex Capital. For more conversations, videos, and transcripts, visit safegraph.com slash podcast. Hello, fellow data nerds. My guest today is Sebastian Malaby, author of The Power Law and many other actually really great books and senior fellow at the Council of Foreign Relations. Sebastian, welcome to World of DAS. Thank you, Aaron. Great to be with you. All right, now I, I read The Power of Law. I loved it. it was, I thought it was the best account of like the venture capital industry. Um, big fan. I uh, highly recommend everyone else to do that. So I just want to get that out of the way. <laughs> and um, now, but the, the I, I thought I'd ask a few questions about VC and then VC history. So, you know, the kind of the most recent boom in venture capital has really coincided with these like historically low interest rates. How much do you think these low interest rates have really affected the VC returns? So you're right that when low interest rates mean that returns on other investments have been depressed, um, particularly any kind of credit, uh, you're not going to get paid much interest. Uh, money flows into risk assets, and so that would include stocks, especially long dated stocks, and the longest dated equity of all is venture, right? Yep. Um, and so I think that definitely has pumped up valuations. And I think that's already correcting. If you see the news about, you know, Tiger Global and other late stage players renegotiating term sheets, because the closer you are to the stock market exit, uh, the more you are hit by public stocks falling in value. Yep. So I think there's going to be a shakeout. Um, but I also think that, you know, a good chunk of the boom in tech in the last 10, 20 years is about fundamentals. It's, it's not just a story about interest rates. And so, you know, just the software is eating the world was a brilliant line from Mark Andreessen because it's true. And, you know, more and more things get uh, software laid on top, they become more efficient, there's value to be extracted. And so I think, you know, it's impossible to say, is that like 60% of what was going on with venture valuations and then interest rates 40% or some number like that, but- yep. It's clearly both. Okay, interesting. Now, when you're when you're a venture capital firm, you're selling a product to LPs, and it, it kind of seems like some of these venture capital firms are selling different products um, and different SKUs. Like Tiger, if you think of the Tiger Global SKU versus the Benchmark SKU, Tiger seems like they're willing to trade returns for the ability to to deploy a lot more capital. And, um, and benchmarks willing to trade capital for returns, right? Do you see it in a similar way or how do you see it? Yeah, totally, you're, you're, you're exactly right. I mean, some people think about dollar returns, in which case deploying a large number of dollars yes. is the way to go. And that's what Tiger has chosen to do. And you do that and at un stage. Unclear that benchmark could do anything at that scale with, with reasonable returns. It's, it's a different, it's almost a, a completely different skill set to, to deploy that many dollars. Correct. It's different both in the types of analysis you do. So early stage, there is zero data to analyze. It's just two-legged mammals walking into your office with a dream. Um, and late stage, there are some numbers on traction, revenues, etc. So there's a different analytical toolbox later stage that Tiger Global does, but there's also a different cadence. Uh, and Tiger is super fast, uh, deploys masses of capital. It essentially has, you know, research into different um, sectors of technology. It tries to identify the market leaders um, in each geography, and it just goes in there and buys. Uh, whereas, you know, if you're doing early stage, you, you know, because there's no data, the market spaces are not established. What's the total addressable market? You don't know really because the market hasn't been invented yet. Yep. So it requires more deliberation. People go slower. Once they've done the investment, they dig in and they get on the board and they try to help the entrepreneur. Um, so it's a totally different type of approach. And as you say, they're selling a different product to LPs. Now, it, the, if Tiger is selling a 15% IRR hopeful product or something like that, um, does that somehow in the end kind of trickle down and we're, it's going to make it more difficult because for other firms to hit the IRR marks that they have in the past? Well, I don't think it matters in sort of purely financial terms, because in some sense, if you're doing early stage, what you want is a is follow on capital. You, you used to get the follow on capital by taking the company public. 
now you're getting follow on from growth stage investors like Tiger Global, it, it just financially, it doesn't matter. Um, but what does I think matter is governance. And, you know, my view is that um, there used to be two models of governance and both of them worked, you know, one was your company is public. And if the management is doing something questionable, you know, people are going to sell the stock, they might even go short the stock. There's a lot of public um, communication mandated by the SEC that, you know, keeps people uh, able to see what's going on. And that's one model of governance, fine. Another model of governance is it's an early stage private company. Uh, the investor goes on the board, the investor has enough shares to actually be listened to um, and is deeply involved. And so if the management uh, might be going in the wrong direction, you've got a, a board member who's engaged enough to actually suggest that, ask the searching question. And now we've invented this middle stage where a company's worth, you know, five, 10 billion, it's private, it's a Decca unicorn, and the public market discipline has not kicked in because it's not public. And the private market discipline has not really functioning, you know, doesn't function anymore because essentially the later stage investors do not go on the board. They've decided that's not what they do. They just provide capital. So now you might have an early stage investor as you did with Benchmark when it invested in Uber or WeWork, where the early stage bet was quite good, particularly with Uber, it was very, very good. Um, but then as the company starts to make some choices that are going to cost it because it, you know, starts cutting corners and regular terms too much, or it goes off the moral rails or whatever it does, you know, the early stage investor in that story was saying, listen, you should innovate, but not in terms of like your financial controls. That's not where you should be innovating. You know, you've got to have serious grown up financial controls. And the early stage investor, in this case, Bill Gurley of Benchmark, was just being ignored because the later stage investors didn't care. These were, you know, the Saudi sovereign wealth fund or whoever. They didn't go on the board. They didn't care. So I think that's the problem, that, that it trickles down and messes up the early stage investment model because this late stage capital comes in and doesn't care about governance. The, it's not like, I mean, Bill Gurley is one of the smartest investors out there. It's not like he didn't go into the Uber investment with his eyes open. Like he knew this is a company that was going to have to raise massive amounts of money over time to be competitive. You know, it's a, it's a this like really making that marketplace happens where it basically involves a lot of VC subsidies that he knew was, I mean, he's definitely one of the smartest. He knows marketplaces is better than anybody. He knew what he was getting into. He knew they would have to raise billions of dollars. So he, he, it's not like we, we, we can't, like he knew what he was doing there, like, and he still invested, right? It's, it's like, it's not like he's like a, a dumb guy. He certainly is not done. Yeah. Um, uh, but I would say a couple of things that, about that. One is that, you know, other firms, for example, Sequoia, you know, seeing this issue that, you know, late stage investors may sort of wrest control of the company from you and then not do much governance. Um, you know, their response is to do an $8 billion growth fund. Correct. You know, they, they, they've, so they've muscled up precisely because they were one of the first venture partners, in fact, the first venture partner, partnership to discover what happens when you don't muscle up. Um, right. The, your story is they got muscled in Yahoo, right, from, from Masayoshi Son. Exactly. You know, it, Son comes along, he visits Yahoo in 1996. He says, very good to meet you. Remind me who your competitors are. And then he says, um, yeah, I'd like to give 100, you know, invest 100 million in your company. And when Jerry Yang of Yahoo says, well, that's very nice. I'm very flattered, but I don't need that. He says, Jerry, everybody needs 100 million. And by the way, <laughs> by the way, if I don't give it to you, I'm going to invest in one of your competitors. And at that point, it's a kind of mafiosi, you know, um, this is an offer you can't refuse thing. And, you know, Moritz of Sequoia, who was the Series A investor, never forgot that because he had done the Series A investment. He had, you know, brought in an outside CEO. He'd done all kinds of things to make Jerry Yang a kind of face on the cover of business magazines. And yet this late stage guy, Masayoshi Son, who did pretty much nothing other than do a mafia trick, you know, he makes more dollars uh, than Sequoia did on that deal because he invested so much money. And, you know, Sequoia says to itself, oh, we're not going to let that happen to us again. And one of the funny moments in my research was when, you know, Michael Moritz, for other reasons, was giving me various internal memos uh, that he'd written to his colleagues at Sequoia. He was trying to prove to me that 
you know, he'd made various arguments to them at various times. And if it hadn't been for Michael, <laughs> you know, Sequoia might have done the wrong thing. But, and I was allowed to quote from these. And in one of these memos, it's, it compared Masayoshi san to Kim Jong un uh, of North Korea. You know, they, they both lob missiles out round. One is actually military missiles, the other one is lobbing uh, financial missiles. Either way, it's doing damage to your business. Um, so <laughs> the, vit the vitriol around that was pronounced. And so I think, you know, yes, uh, Bill Gurley is not remotely dumb. He's extremely smart. He knew marketplace businesses really, really well. Um, but, you know, he is locked in this position, which Sequoia also saw, and they responded by building a growth fund. Benchmark chose not to do that. I think it's, it's a problem for their business model. And I regret that because I think Benchmark is a sort of exemplary early stage investor, super thoughtful, super involved, helpful to the entrepreneur. And I, I think it's a pity if the Benchmark uh, model has a bit of a shadow over it from, from growth investing. And, and Gurley also has a history of um, funding kind of irreverent founders who are kind of like the Travis Kalanick. He, he funds a lot of people that look just like that person. So he, he also knows going in like, okay, this is the type of person I like. And obviously those people have both pros and cons as, as we all do. Um, and so he, he, he went in knowing exactly the type of person that he was getting behind. He's so good at finding, like he has a history of finding all these people that are just like this. Uh, so it's a, it's like, in some ways it, everything played out as expected. Um, like if Uber was going to be super successful, then you would, if, if you were just game playing it all the way through, you would game play exactly that tension that, that ended up happening there. Yeah, except that if we take another example of an investor who in an earlier phase of the history um, picked tough, uh, you know, sort of brilliant but wayward entrepreneurs. So the Don uh, Valentine or? Uh, ex yeah. yeah, you got yeah. it. Yeah, exactly. Don Valentine. I mean, it, it's a great um, comparison with Bill Gurley because, uh, by the way, I think it's perhaps not a coincidence that they're both kind of physically imposing people, right? Don, Val <laughs> Don Valentine was a Navy uh, water polo player. So when he invested in Atari, the first gaming um, you know, company in the Valley, uh, they had this game called Pong. Uh, and um, you know, that was a crazy company. They had a great product, um, but you know, if you weren't used to marijuana smoke and you went in their factory, it hits you pretty hard. And the, the, the board meetings took place in the hot tub. Um, so, you know, there are a couple of investors visiting Atari one day and they're told to get in the hot tub. And the guy uh, from Fidelity is not going to do that. So he sort of st <laughs> stays there on the side looking embarrassed. Valentine strips his shirt off and that actually gives him advantage, right? Because he's, <laughs> he's showing that water polo chest. So he's not frightened of these um, slightly wayward people. And he did the same thing with Cisco. It was a pretty chaotic company, but a brilliant product. And in both cases, Atari and Cisco, he took them to an exit uh, because the exits in those days were much, much earlier. Um, in one case, he, he got them, you know, Atari sold to Warner Brothers. In the other case, he took Cisco public. Um, so that worked out for him. But the difference with Gurley was, although he's not a water polo player, he's a basketball <laughs> player and he's got whatever, six foot nine inches of him to, to, to conjure with. Um, you know, he's good at, uh, um, you know, being both intellectually and physically impressive and therefore taking a founder like Travis Kalanick, who is brilliant, but has a slightly wild streak um, and turning that brilliance into its maximum output and, and, and containing the wild streak when you need to, except that in the, in the, period of you know the 2010s we're in a different world now and you know uber is getting this late stage capital and um and therefore Gurley loses and, and in some ways the big world though is that it's not necessarily there's late stage capital it's that today in today's world in the girly world capital is completely abundant um and in the don valentine world capital was scarce and so in the don valentine world you're selling capital in the um, in the girly world, you're you're basically uh, you you have to empower the founder because they're the ones in the in the driver's seat. Is that is that the big change or? You know, I mean, I think there's a lot of truth to that in general about venture that um, capital is plentiful and um, also software companies don't need as much capital as uh, semiconductor companies used to in the early days of venture. 
And so the terms of trade between the entrepreneur and the venture investor have shifted you know, clearly in favor of the entrepreneur. And um, so founder friendliness is the result of all that. But, you know, um, as you were saying earlier, when it came to building Uber, um, a lot of capital was needed. And so theoretically, the capital providers had some leverage. It's just that they sort of didn't choose to use it. Um, I mean, you could argue, yeah, you needed a lot of capital, but even so, there was plenty and plenty and plenty, and so they had no leverage. Uh, maybe that's right. Um, but I think in a, you know, in a different world where the norms of the late stage investors were more pro-governance, um, we would have had a different experience. And, and in a way, the test here is, you know, think of the contrast between WeWork and Uber. You know, WeWork and Uber both backed by Benchmark. Um, both, you know, were kind of headed in totally the right direction early on. WeWork had a, um, I think it made a profit um, at the beginning. Um, and it then went nuts when Masayoshi Son came on and just sort of piled crazy capital on it. And it just said, go, grow, 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 grow. Uh, and then it, you know, the quality of all its real estate deals declined and governments went out of the windows. So Adam Newman was self-dealing. Uh, and, and, and that ended in a mess. But in, in both these cases, Uber and WeWork, ultimately it's the need to go public that imposes discipline. So it's back to what I said earlier, in the public markets, there is some discipline. And when WeWork was getting ready for going public, it adopted a series of, you know, Catalytic was booted out and it adopted a series of financial controls that Gurley had been urging from much earlier on for Uber. And in the case of WeWork, they didn't do those things before the planned IPO in whatever it was, 2019, uh, 2018 maybe. And, and so the, the, the IPO was canceled. Because but but in both, both WeWork and Uber's case, like Benchmark made just amazing returns on both of those investments in the end, right? Um, I mean, they're incredible. I mean, maybe they could have been even more incredible if certain things happened, but they were both, I mean, they both were basically fund returning investments. Yes, that's right. So I think, I think I agree that, you know, Gurley went into these things with his eyes open. He made, you know, Benchmark made money in both cases. The late stage. Not just money, like they made the, real uh, yeah, money. Tons, they made yeah. <laughs> a lot more money. I mean, Don Valentine would have been like, he would have been amazed at all this money that could have been made on these types of investments. You're absolutely right. Yeah, that, that's completely true. Um, so we shouldn't be crying about the fate of these investors at all. Um, and the late stage people, some made money, some didn't, depending on when they went in. But anyway, they took their own risks. That's fine. That's their problem. I do think, though, that in a sort of larger frame, partly, just for the sake of the health of capitalism, you know, large companies without governance are troubling. And also for the sake of the kind of public acceptability of the tech sector. When you've got, you know, companies like, Uni like, uh, like, like Uber, who, you know, suddenly everyone's deleting their app from their phone because they can't stand its behavior. It's just not, you know, that, that sort of backlash spills over into tech more generally. And I think that's unfortunate because we need the society to accept what tech is doing. Disruption is always, going to be a bit controversial you don't need to make it more controversial than it has to be no uh, i don't know if you're a fan of alex danko he's one of my favorite writers and he has this like analogy where he likens founders to kings and vcs to priests where do you think like that analogy it makes sense and where do you think it may break down um so i'm not in favor of kings or priests i mean uh, <laughs> I, I i i i would like you know i just go do some alexander hamilton instead i mean you know checks and balances uh, um, um you know i think i think great people no matter how great they are can do with some disagreement around them and um some checks and some challenges and you know, some of the time the market is providing that and it's all good. Some of the time founders can be extraordinarily well calibrated so that they can internally check themselves and they don't need uh, outside anything. But, you know, a lot of the time we're all human beings and it's healthy to have folks around you who are sort of serious and smart and, and, and push back sometimes. So I don't think, you know, I don't think the VC should be a priest because, you know, the VC is just offering an opinion. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's not some scriptural thing. And a good VC will say, you know, I offer an opinion and I might be wrong. And I, so I, I, I ask questions on the board 
I tend not to give orders because that would be wrong. Uh, it, but, but a searching question or two is good. Um, and so I think both sides, both the entrepreneur and the uh, venture person on the board should acknowledge their own limitations. But even, I mean, even if you like, if you think of some of the most successful founders recently, like let's say the founder of Zoom or something, which is where we're recording this, um, he has complete control of the company. But you know, for all for for everything that's written about him, he's an incredibly humble person. He loves getting advice. He doesn't. I'm sure he doesn't always take it, but he asks lots of people and he gets advice. There's no real necessarily true governance, though. Like he is the ultimate person, but he's he he has his own humility to. And in ultimately, like, don't you think it's it's really just the fact like you're investing in this person, you get a sense of who this person is. Are they someone who's going to kind of seek advice? Maybe fame gets to them and they change over time. They no longer they're just driving their fast cars. They don't want to take advice anymore. But most of these people who like later on like that you wrote about like weren't willing to take advice like you knew even when you were investing in them when they had zero dollars in revenue they weren't going to be the person to to take it i don't agree with that Aaron. okay i mean, I, All right, I, good. I i i think let, let's take mark zuckerberg as an example yeah. you know super 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 talented guy who is not distracted by fast cars as far as i know is completely committed to the company and takes jaw-droppingly bold risks in pivoting it um uh, uh you know maximum respect okay but the fact is that in the early stage when he um was getting going and the venture capitalists did have some power in the company this this is excel which was the series a investor uh and there was this scandal around sean parker his business partner i guess he's he was titled with something like president of facebook yep and uh, he gets busted on the way on on the east coast in a beach house with drugs and blah 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 I mean, none of that was, I think, no charges were ever um, proven. So let's just say that. But there was a um, reputational you know, result from, from that. And it wasn't a great look for, for building a company culture. And against Mark Zuckerberg's first instincts, the venture investors essentially insisted that Sean Parker should be removed. And he was removed. And I am fairly sure that this was an extremely good thing for Facebook, that um, you know, when you're building the early culture to have somebody like that inside the company is gonna be a problem, a distraction, it's going to be corrosive. Facebook without um, Sean Parker did fantastically well. So one can't argue that you know, some special source was removed. I mean, it, it did brilliantly. Um, and and then you fast forward to a world in which- Sorry, you know, just, just, to, just yeah. to play it back, because in that case, like. Zuckerberg still made the ultimate decision. He took advice. He wasn't forced to, he, he took some advice and in some ways he almost, I, you know, he had to fire his friend, which is always a very, very difficult thing to do. And he had, now he could use an excuse that the VCs were, were, were doing this. And he knew ultimately it was, it was, it was the best move for the company, but of course it's always hard to fire your friend. And so you need to, think about it and he 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 had almost the humility to get advice and then he made the decision which maybe ultimately was may or may not have been the right decision ultimate but he but he he alone made that decision he had the full control of the company okay um that's a better and more nuanced way of making the point i was trying to make that you know okay fine mark zuckerberg made the final call but it's certainly the case that it was easier for him to make that call with VCs that he listened to because they did have whatever share of the company it wasn't that it wasn't actually that big. I think Excel took twelve and a half percent. Yeah, um, but still they had they had some weight. Um, and if you imagine a world in which the VCs had no weight, they didn't even take a board seat. They were not engaged. A zero governance sort of thing, which you know is partly a late stage thing, as I was saying earlier. But you know there are people like Peter Thiel and Founders Fund that as a sort of policy matter pretty much, you know, wouldn't tell, um, and I think didn't tell uh, Mark to get rid of Sean Parker. Um, and Founders Fund you know, believes that's the right way to do it. Um, you know, that's their choice. They're a successful fund and very smart people. But I think that it was a service to um, Facebook to give that advice. And even if you tell me, yes, but Mark made a final decision, I don't disagree. Yeah. But he might not have made the decision without without the governance thing. So I think, you know, even in this case of possibly the most sort of strong, lucid, 
determined, focused, brilliant founder of the last, or one of them anyway, for the last 15 years, he benefited from VC advice. And I would say that later, you know, who knows, but I, I, I would suggest that if he'd had slightly less control in the last four or five years, um, he might have played some of these choices differently and, and the brand of Facebook or Meta would have been in better shape today. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. We, we can, this is probably where we, we a bit disagree because I, I think in, in that case and in, in the Parker case, like I, I'm, there were, there were other lieutenants that, that, that Zuckerberg had who also suggested that, that Parker, so it wasn't, it wasn't just Excel. Um, he, he was hearing from a lot of different voices of people that he trusted. And yes, it's a very hard decision to, to, to fire your friend. Um, and, um, and, uh, but, but I, I don't think it was just like Jim Breyer's voice and that was it. Uh, that 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 made that decision happen there. But on, on another thing, like, what do you think of the sweet tax treatment of ca carried interest that that VCs have? Do you think that's a, a good thing? Do you think that really helped innovation? Or do you think it's a little bit of a, a giveaway? I know a lot of people have different opinions about that. It's a great question. I mean, I wrote a book earlier about hedge funds, and in that case, so they have similar, yeah, yeah, they have the same structure of both compensation and then tax treatment. And I said that the carry ought to be taxed as income tax, in other words, at a higher rate than it is now. Um, because, you know, I just think it's better for society to have um, extremely successful rich people tax a bit more. Yep. Uh, and, and what hedge funds and, and investment managers do is, you know, their job is to go manage assets and, and make investments. And if they make money from that work, it looks like income to me. I mean, you can call it capital gain. You can call it carry, you can call it whatever you want, but basically they're working and then they're getting money for the work. It looks to me like, like income. So I think it's better to tax as income. But when it comes to venture, I think it's a slightly different, more nuanced and difficult call because um, unlike just about every other type of finance, venture has a positive externality for society. What I mean is that most of the time, you know, you've got banks, you've got, you know, money market funds, you've got insurance companies, you've got, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And all of these guys are ultimately going to be bailed out by the government um, in a financial crisis, as we saw in 2008. And so in some extent, they're taking excess risk to, to juice their returns at the expense of um, the taxpayer, which is providing implicit insurance for their risk taking. And so society's paying some you know insurance premium yeah to, to allow these guys to do what they're doing so i think you know that that's a that's a tax on society and and therefore there's a case for for raising taxes from these people who do that on the other hand venture if one believes as i do that it's you know boosting innovation and we could talk about the ways in which i believe that's happening um i think it's a positive externality for society because it's fostering you know, more startups that create more knowledge, that create more applied science, and, and that knowledge spills over into the economy in different ways and boosts productivity and boosts, um, pro, you know, prosperity. And, and by the way, also national defense sometimes. Uh, and so I think it's a positive for society to have lots of venture. Um, and therefore, um, a tax subsidy to venture capital by taxing the carry in a forgiving manner makes sense to me. So I would actually be generous. Interesting. Venture. Okay. That's very, that's very interesting. Now the, um, the pandemic has certainly accelerated the decentralization of Silicon Valley, even some very, very long-term residents like myself have, have moved away. What is, what is your prediction of how venture capital will look geographically? I think that even without the pandemic, um, venture and startups and the whole tech ecosystem was growing so much uh, that it was going to bust out of Silicon Valley in any case. And we were seeing that. If you look at the newest um, centers of tech innovation, take China, it's interesting that there is no one city that dominates Chinese tech. Yeah. Right. There's some in Beijing, some in Shanghai, some in Hong Kong, some in Hangzhou, et cetera. Um, and I think that's kind of the normal pattern. If you create a venture ecosystem, you know, starting in the 2000s uh, or in the late 1990s. Uh, and so I think Silicon Valley was a bit of a historical special case where 
you know, the idea of how you do venture, and this is part of what I'm trying to describe in my history, the history part of my book, you know, it, it was a special method of financing tech that people in Boston thought they understood but didn't because the kind of venture they did was different in, in Boston and on the East Coast. And so basically, um, Silicon Valley had kind of a Sand Hill Road monopoly on, on how you do this power law, you know, um, long shot but very high return um, disruptive investing. And, and then there were kind of geographic network effects at a time where you couldn't do deals over Zoom. And I think with the pandemic, we've just speeded up that process towards yeah. a world in which there are multiple um, innovation centers. Now, um, one of the one of the things I loved about your book was how you really dived into you really got into the psyche in a way of Michael Moritz, who is almost certainly, if not the best all time VC, definitely, definitely top 10, maybe top three, depending on who you who you talk to. Um, and but he's also in some ways the VC that most looks like you, right? He he probably has the most similar background to you. Do you think that kind of some of that common background allowed you to understand and get deeper into Moritz as opposed to other, you know, well-known VCs? Uh, not really. In fact, okay. <laughs> there's a funny story there because right at the beginning of my research, you know, I tried to kind of tap into any friendship or link that um, that I might have to make introductions in in this new world that I didn't really know and. I remember Aaron, you were very generous to me. You, we had lunch and you shot out a bunch of emails and yep. various people did that. And I had a friend because Moritz is originally British um, and because he was originally a journalist uh, and a book writer, I had a friend in London who, who knew him a bit and who made an introduction. And I thought to myself, this is terrific. I'm <laughs> you know, one of the great stars of the business and, you know, I've written books and he's written books and you know he was originally British and I'm originally British and we both naturalized in the US and so it works, it's gonna be great. <laughs> and, and I went to see him and he said, you know, at the end he said after coffee, he said, look, yeah, it's great to meet you, but but don't think we're gonna to talk to you at Sequoia. We're, we have zero interest in talking to a writer. I mean, <laughs> we, we, we are top of this industry. And so why would we share our methods with anybody else? And we're raised more capital than we need. And, there's just no upside in wasting time on talking to writers, you know, said the ex-writer. Yeah. <laughs> so it, it took me. You well, know, how, so how did you get him? I mean, because I, I, I mean, I, the book may have been quite good without him, but it was especially good. The fact that you were able to get him to open up the kimono. So how did how did that happen? Well, um, you know, I'm always patient. The reason these projects take me five years is that I'm willing to you know, be rebuffed um, and, 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 and work hard and then, you know, get in later. So what I did in this case is I just went off and did the obvious stuff. You know, I, I talked to every person I could find who had been at Sequoia and then had left. I talked to lots of VCs who'd been on board sitting next to Sequoia investors. I talked to entrepreneurs who'd been backed by Sequoia. I made sure that, you know, uh, my brilliant research associate had you know, watched every single YouTube video that anybody from Sequoia ever did and, you know, picked up every speech or every comment or what, you know. So I had this enormous amount of data on, on what Sequoia had done, even without being allowed in the front door. And then one day I was giving a speech to a group of finance people um, about my book about Alan Greenspan. And one person in the audience came up and said, gee, you know, that was good. And, you know, I, I'd love to you know have coffee. So we had coffee and he said, um, well, you know, um, I run private investments for, for one of the big university endowments. So I, maybe I won't say which. And, um, and, you know, if I could be helpful with your venture research, that'd be great. <laughs> so I said, yeah, hmm, well, I know that you, you invested with Sequoia. So I'm having a little bit of resistance there. Oh, sure, I'll send an email. So he sent an email, this time to Doug Leone. I remember this was a, a Saturday. And within about three minutes, Doug Leone emails me saying, sure, how can I help? Uh, wow, because, okay, interesting. You know, the, they had heard enough about you at this point. Uh, well, but, yeah. it was, but it was the power of the big endowment, right? Or, yeah. As well, you know, that's your customer. Um, and so you try to be responsive. And then, you know, that led to some more emails and they checked me out. And by this time I had done enough research, I was allowed to have three interviews. And then those interviews demonstrated, um, you know, that I'd done a lot of homework. I remember though it still wasn't easy. I went in and, you know, 
when Michael Moritz sat down with me at that meeting, he took the long, careful list of questions that I had devised, trying to prove how much homework I had done on every, every investment he'd made. <laughs> and he looked at me and he said, these are very dull questions. <laughs> so I said, well, what do you want to talk about? And I, he said, uh, uh, well, let's talk about something exciting, uh, China. And I said, great, okay, so how do you do venture in China that's different to how you do it in the US? And he looked at me and said, well, China is a big country. Uh, China is growing fast. And I said, that's a very dull answer, Michael. <laughs> you are a smart guy and you're wasting my time. <laughs> and, and after that, we got along much better. Um, and, and then I was told I had high ROI. That was the expression. <laughs> And then and I mean, you 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 really can't write if you're writing a history of venture capital, you cannot write it without Sequoia because it is is it has been the dominant firm for many, many generations of venture capital. So it is, it's the most important one to to really dive into. Do you agree with that or? I do think that I mean, I think that I mean, in the end, I spent a huge amount of time with Sequoia and I came to respect their work enormously. I thought they were super thoughtful. You know, when I began researching venture capital, one of my puzzles, which was even an obstacle to doing the book, was how do you allocate capital in this, you know, early stage, super uncertain area? And is it just luck when people get, you know, happen to partner with an entrepreneur who does super well because the entrepreneur, yeah. is, you know, maybe the venture person didn't do anything. And I think when you spend a lot of time with Sequoia, you understand that they do do quite a bit, both in deal selection and then maybe in, in, in helping the company afterwards um, to, to me the most hmm. amazing thing about sequoia I, i'd be really interested i mean they have there's a lot of firm investors that have done incredibly well as a as an individual investor because a lot of venture capital is is almost an individual sport it's like you know running a marathon race or something like that they have had now th they're on their third succession right so they've been able to transfer this over multi-generations where really no other firm you know maybe with a couple of exceptions has been able to do that so they've really been able they're they're, they're much more of a company like that you would point to that you would want to fund than just a collection of people that's true exactly and i think you you know when you get inside the tent, you sort of understand a few things about why that happens. For example, the degree of care that the senior people spend on um, kind of growing the younger team members is remarkable. Um, and I think that's, you know, as you say, it is a sort of individual sport or that's how it's seen um, from the outside sometimes. And I think some, part, some partnerships believe that and that's where they mess up because they bring in a young person who's you know, maybe 32 and has done a few things, has an engineering degree, maybe a business degree, maybe has um, done their own startup or, or, or been a kind of co-founder. And I mean, I think those are the three key sorts of background that, that VCs, if they're good, have, and they probably have at least two of those three things, you know, some engineering or technical thing, some, some business savvy and, and some startup experience. Um, so you bring these people in and they're looking, you know, pretty promising, but they haven't actually invested before. And there's two approaches. You can just leave them to sink or swim, and then they might well sink. Or yeah. you, you, you can build them into investors. And so Sequoia, what they do, for example, is, you know, when Rudolf Berta, who's now emerging as the leader of the firm, was that person, the young guy who's like 30-ish, um, and he brought in his first um deal he wanted to do, which was a remittances company called Zoom with an X yep. at the beginning. Um, uh, Pierre Lamont, who was one of the older senior investors, said, look, Rudolf, we'll do a, a, a partnership together here. Um, I'll go on the board because you're new to this business, uh, but you will um, come with me and shadow me and you'll learn everything about it. If this startup fails, because many startups do fail, uh, I will take the hit on my reputation, which is fine because I'm a older guy and I can take that and it won't be a black mark on your resume but if it looks like it's going to work we're going to flip positions and you're going to get the glory when this thing has an exit and that glory is going to mean that you have uh, you're perceived to have the Midas touch in the industry and you'll get more access to deals after that and, so but, that, and that, that is an incredible thing and I, I, I love that anecdote in the book it's an incredible thing and you contrast that where 
you with with even other amazing firms like Kleiner that didn't do that didn't really develop their 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 young talent is that is that just something where Sequoia really had the foresight or is it somehow in the operating manual or or how did, how did that even happen I think that the leadership of Sequoia and this is why Michael Moritz I think does stand out as sort of the best or equal best venture investor of all time because it wasn't just that he did great deals like you know Yahoo or Google. Yeah, it, it, it's that he built a company, right? His best investment was in Sequoia itself. That's right. And so he built it into China. He built it into India. He built it into growth investing. He built a hedge fund. I mean, he didn't do all this by himself, but I think he provided the leadership impetus, um, you know. And then with his partners, they all built it together. But I think you know another thing that he did and that his partners did with him is to be very deliberate about doing stuff like that with Rudolf that, you know, they, they did, you know, another anecdote um, from Samir Gandhi, who was a young uh, investor at, at Sequoia and then went to Axel later, um, was that, you know, he was beginning his career in venture, he was running around, it was very hard to figure out which, which, which meeting to take, which not to take, your schedule is always totally crazy and overloaded, you can't do everything. How do you maintain some sense of ability to think when, <laughs> when you're running around that fast? And so Michael Moritz sat down with him and said, let's take a look at your schedule for the last few months and, and, and have a discussion about what meetings maybe you didn't need to do or how you could have done this differently. And so that attention from the top person in the firm to the scheduling skills of yeah. somebody, it, yeah. it's pretty, it's pretty basic. remarkable. Yeah, uh, ab absolutely amazing. Okay. And now, a uh, couple. I, I know you're a student of the Fed. You wrote this great book about Alan Greenspan. Um, where, where, what do you think is? What do you think about the? What about the 2008 global financial crisis that maybe most people don't understand? You mean with respect to venture, or just generally? No, with respect generally. Yeah, generally, generally. So the biggest thing um, I tried to show in my book about Alan Greenspan. Is, is that he was the man who knew. In other words, that's the title of the book. And it's yep. also the message of the book. The point being that this was a person who unbeknownst to others, but I discovered by doing the early work on his career and his writings and finding writings that nobody else had found before, like his PhD thesis, like his speeches that he um, did for Ayn Rand and when he was in his thirties, you know, he had been thinking about bubbles as like the central preoccupation of his intellectual focus yeah. um, from early on in his life. And, that, and, and, and yet his own tenure at the Fed was undone by the fact that this bubble inflated late in his, in his, on his watch, and then it burst in 2007, 2008. Um, and so why did this person who understood everything about bubbles um, allow this bubble to inflate? He was the man who knew that he, he was not the man who acted. Yeah. And I think when you frame it like that, you, you come to realize that it, it was not ignorance that was the problem. It was sort of institutional constraints. It was pressures from the environment of Washington. And that from that, it follows. But he that. ultimately is a political animal, right? Like, I mean, he he's he's swayed by the it's, it's not like he's in this tower deciding he, he he he's swayed by what other the public opinion is and what other people will need in Washington, et cetera. Right. Yes, I think the Federal Reserve leadership always operates within a kind of enabling environment and, and, and the, you know, the culture, the political society and so forth has to be OK with what it's doing um, because it won't be tenable otherwise. And so even Paul Volcker, who famously raised interest rates you know, through the roof and jammed down double digit inflation, he could do that because he came into office in 1979 was when high inflation was the main preoccupation in opinion polls, you know, survey data about yeah. like, what, what Americans care about. So he had a kind of popular mandate to do that. Um, so, I mean, I think the point here is that it's not like you can get rid of Alan Greenspan, you get rid of bad Fed policy. You know, it, it was a way bigger systemic sort of political cultural thing that meant it was difficult to raise interest rates um, when you were fighting a bubble, um, much easier to raise interest rates if you were fighting inflation. What actually, you know, just to make a comment on the here and now, what alarms me and almost you know, which surprises me, maybe shocks me, is that we've now got a 7.5% inflation print, 
markets, I would say, are, are still, you know, clearly overvalued, although they've corrected a bit. And yet the Fed is going super slow um, about the rate at which it raises interest rates. Um, I think that's a mistake. So you think they should, it's like when you, if you have to lay off people, you lay them off all at once and then you build it back up as a, that's usually the advice they give to people. You, you think the Fed should be doing something similar where they, they should be aggressive right away rather than these gradual increases or? Yeah, I mean, so, well, Fed, you know, Fed uh, policy always is balancing, you know, you don't want to crater the economy, but you also don't want to let inflation come out of control. Now, if you look at the latest jobs number, which was very strong, lots of new jobs being created, um, unemployment is down below 4% again. I think it's pretty tough to say the economy is in this really weak position and you really, wow, you know, you really need to cost it this. I mean, even though the Ukraine Russia thing is a huge wow. Yeah, we're, and just so it, because we're taping this like as the Ukraine Russia thing is, is happening right now. And that will, that also certainly puts pressure on inflation as well. We should probably see oil prices go up significantly over time, et cetera, right? Yeah. If one was trying to bend over backwards and be sympathetic to the Fed, one would say, yes, it creates inflation pressure, but it also creates growth, downward pressure on growth. But I think basically at the moment, you've got an economy which is very strong in terms of growth, very strong in terms of employment, but has excessive inflation. And so you clearly should be targeting that high inflation and not worrying so much about the growth. And I think raising interest rates a quarter point this month, which is what they've signaled, we're in March now, and they've already signaled that at the next meeting, it will be a quarter point. Um, you know, you could have done a half point. It would have meant that you're more serious about the inflation side of the problem. I think that would have been better. And how much, how much does, even, even if it was a half point or full point or two points or something like that, like how much does this really, could this really clamp down on inflation when the government has massively increased its spending? So we're seeing just a lot more money flow into the system anyway. Um, and there's lots of other, you know, uh, supply constraints and other. So how, how much can the Fed actually affect inflation with one, you know, one, one or two points of, uh, of, of interest rate? Uh, a lot. I mean, um, the Fed's power is awesome. That's why when the Fed stimulated massively when COVID hit, we actually got through uh, those two years without a Great Depression. And in fact, the balance sheets, the sort of financial position of, of American households uh, got better, not worse, uh, because of stimulus. But th effect. that's also partially due to, 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 to government action, just basically more spending by the government, which could have happened without the Fed, right? Mm, well, tough to do it, because if, if the federal government sends out stimulus checks whilst the Fed is tight, the interest rates are such that the national debt from those stimulus checks. Well, that's goes, true. Yeah. Goes, so, yeah. So, so you kind of need the Fed to be backstopping the, the federal spending. And I think that, um, you know, just as the Fed was a key part, not the only part, but a key part of that COVID response in, in supporting the economy, it now needs to be the key part in, in fighting inflation. And it does that. I mean, people sometimes say, oh, yeah, the Fed only controls the short term interest rate. I mean, that's wrong on multiple levels. First of all, it's been doing quantitative easing, which affects the longer term yeah. interest rates. So if it does quantitative tightening, in other words, the opposite, it can affect directly the long term interest rate. And secondly, if you surprise the markets by raising 50 basis points, not a quarter uh, of a percentage point, um, the markets are going to respond by pushing up long term interest rates. So the Fed has enormous power. And Paul Volcker proved that for once and for all. You know, you could have double digit peacetime inflation and that inflation went away when the Fed got tough. And we have now have today a Fed with way more sophistication and knowledge about how its instruments work uh, than we did in the early 1980s. Of course, the Fed can control inflation. Isn't the Fed, uh, now that the debt is so high, isn't the Fed a lot more constrained today than it was even, even a few years ago? Uh, because if you do push up the interest rate, it it will hurt the, gov the government's ability because the government bills will start going up because we'll have to pay larger and larger uh, bills to service our debt. Yes. So uh, we'll be back in the sort of George H.W. Bush um, regime yep. where he had got elected saying, uh, read my lips, no new taxes. And then the Fed raised interest rates and increased the, the you know, government's cost of uh, financing its debt. And then George H.W. Bush did raise interest rates 
and did lose the election as a result. Raised taxes. Yeah. I mean, sorry, yeah. did raise yeah. the taxes. Yeah. So, um, yes, it will be painful if the Fed raises interest rates, but to say that it can't uh, clamp down on inflation is wrong. Okay. It, there'll, there'll be pain, but you can do it. Okay, cool. A couple of personal questions before I leave. A lot of these I've always wanted to ask you. So one is, I, I think you were present when Nelson Mandela left prison cell um, at where he was held for over a quarter of a century. Like, what are some, maybe what's a non-obvious thing about Mandela that most people who weren't there would, would, would not understand? I mean, you know, this is, uh, the obvious bit is Mandela was a hero, right? Correct. But non, the non-obvious bit is he was like even more of a hero than you thought. I mean, they, 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 I mean, I think, I mean, I, I, I really. The, I mean, he is. It is. He is one of the most incredible people. I mean, I, I just don't know of another scenario where, you know, he he does seem like this forgiving, truly forgiving person. Yes, you know, when when he came out of jail, you know the way there may be some fancy cars that are an exception to this, but basically when you open a car door, you open it towards the front of the car, right? You pull that door. Yeah. The old fashioned cars, you know, used to open with the door pulling the opposite way, particularly yep. in the back. And so Mandela, having been in jail for 27 years, comes out, he thinks the car door opens the other way. I mean, <laughs> that's how long he was put in jail for. He just, you know, he, he missed, you know, 27 years of his life. He missed like the prime of his life. I mean, the sacrifice is awesome. Yeah. But he came out and he was totally forgiving. And, you know, he was he was not hostile to white South Africans. He did that whole thing about supporting the white South African rugby team yeah. as a sort of reconciliation gesture. Um, his his wisdom and his his generosity are just amazing. I, it, when the more I read about uh, Mandela, the more I'm almost concerned that we'll never have anybody else like him. Like I, I don't know that you could teach your children to be like that in any way, or it, like he's just kind of a one of a kind person. Like, is there anything we can learn from him where actually it could make us all a little, a little bit better? Wow. Um, I mean, I think the lesson might be that in extreme adversity. People can surprise you massively on the upside. That they yeah. will respond with unbelievable bravery. And I think, you know, whether you look at, you know, Zelensky as we speak, he's still, you know, holding out in in Kiev. Frankly, who knows how long he'll survive? That. Yeah. But the guy knows he's staring death in the face, and he's being as brave as as brave as one could be. You know, a month ago he was regarded not only as a professional comedian by background, but as a bit of a joker as a president. And he really, really changed and stepped up. And when I listen to stories, you know, my, my, um, on my mother's side, my ancestors were French and a lot of them during the Second World War, there were some, you know, partly Jewish families. So a lot of resistance, a lot of bravery. And I think people respond and do amazing stuff when they kind of feel they have to. So human okay. nature is not as cynical as we think. Okay, interesting. Now, uh, I, I know that Neil Ferguson is one of your uh, favorite writers. He was also a guest here on World of Das. Who, who's an up and coming, maybe perhaps not as famous writer that you really admire? Well, I'm always get put on the spot with these. <laughs> these. <laughs> um, so um, up and coming. Um, well, there's Jimmy Cerny, who has just written a book about the founders uh, book. The, the PayPal yeah. book. Um, he's done two books. I don't know if that's still up and coming, but I think he's he's a, a, a writer to watch. Yeah, yeah. He's definitely not, he's not like you or, or Neil who've written lots of well-known books yet. So yeah, I could see him being like the the next Sebastian Malaby in the future or something. Uh, now, okay, your your wife um, is the editor-in-chief of The Economist and you guys are kind of an intellectual powerhouse couple I once went to dinner with the two of you and and really came away odd. Like, what is it like to be like at the breakfast table at your home? Like, are you like, how are you guys like navigating this? Is this just like a salon that happens every time you guys have coffee or what goes on there? There's there's quite a lot of salon. I mean, you know, we both are fascinated by the same political economy issues. We have slightly different networks. Um, uh, and so we just love 
discussing uh, the this stuff. I think the one thing I've learned as a safety mechanism is that there's a. I've, it took me a long time into my relationship with my wife to figure this out, but there is a certain moment on Wednesday slash Thursday because the Economist deadline is you know Wednesday night. They ah uh, yeah yeah yeah. Th yeah probably Thursday, it's very stressful right there. <laughs> th Thursday morning they're finalizing it. It's not so much that my wife is stressed because she has an unbelievable capacity for like you know working incredibly hard on four hours sleep and being not stressed, but she's taken a position right. She's you know they, they, they've committed to paper and in print and if you start debating that position um, <laughs> it's too late yeah it's too late yeah yeah yeah, yeah. debate it on sunday or something like that <laughs> all right this is great all right last question we ask all of our guests what is the conventional wisdom or advice that you think is generally bad advice wow okay so conventional wisdom or advice that's bad advice um I think people say don't care about money. That's a sort of, you know, piece of advice. You know, follow your dream, do what you love, do what you're passionate about. Um, I think the reality, I mean, I think that's a good corrective against some of the forces in the culture that point you too much towards money. Yeah. But I also think that, you know, some element of thinking about how much money you're going to make is is a way of thinking about your future freedom and i think that's not to be sniffed at god so you think of someone who really truly felt follow that advice like later on in life they would feel much more constrained and wouldn't be able to follow their you know their true passions or if your passions change you're kind of stuck in that job you have or etc right i mean it's a balance you want to do what you're what you're passionate about what you enjoy and all that but you also want to have the freedom to change your mind yeah and and and, and actually have the freedom to, to to devote yourself because you know when you start um you have few commitments in life and you don't mind you know sharing a room with or sharing a, a small apartment with three friends or whatever it is from college you're willing to you don't care about that stuff but you know 10 15 20 years later you might have kids and then it's a slightly different setup. And if you don't have enough money to, to let's say, get a place to live, which is a reasonable distance from where you need to go to work uh, or whatever it is, you know, your energy will be taken up with survival and you will be less of a creative person. And some people can make that trade off and still be super creative. But I think it's helpful when you're trying to do stuff that you feel satisfied by to be less distracted by the stuff that that you just need to do to get by what do you, you know, there's something about like where there's a certain amount of savings that you have in the bank that allows you to pretty much always be ethical um and if you have less than whatever that amount of savings less than x number of months of runway or something like that you you may have to make compromises uh whereas if you have more than that you can you have the luxury of being a more ethical person yes yeah, so in other words money allows you to do what you want but also to be what you want correct uh, and and that's important i mean if i could just make a quick final segue back to venture capital from this you know in life people are often pointed at and then and someone says no this person succeeded of course they were smart of course they were ambitious and driven and hardworking, but they also had these two unfair advantages they began life with money and connections, right? And I think of venture capitalists in a way as people who arrive and identify talent and give that talent money and connections. Yeah. Uh, and it's that's why I call it liberation capital in part of my book. You know, it, I, I think, yeah. So that's related to your question about why money matters. And, and last question, because when you when I read your book, you you are you're 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 unabashedly pro venture capital throughout the whole book i mean obviously there's some dark sides and stuff but and which you do point out in a very very fair way but you you come away after your long study in venture capital being um probably more pro venture capital than you had in any of your past books that i read where you maybe had more of a mixed view of the, of the subjects of those views do you think it is because the venture capital is just unabashedly a better thing than some of the things that you've written about in the in the past or or, or why do you think you came and, and and were you coming that way going in or is that something that kind of evolved over time well 
I am more positive about venture capital because I think the business of innovation is so important to building prosperity and improving human lives. And so because I believe that, you know, entrepreneurs and invention are important, but those things get enabled by venture capital. And in some sense, it's the business environment um, that allows somebody with a great idea to go form a company and not to worry too much about failure, because if you fail, you can raise money another time. Not to worry too much about, can you hire the first five employees for your company to help build a product? Because the venture investor may help you to you know, identify and then you know, bring in those early employees. All of the risks around pursuing innovation through startups are mitigated, not removed, but mitigated by VC. I do think it's just like super important as a contribution to, to society. Did I think that going in? I mean, I had an inkling of it, but I think it, the idea became firmer and firmer in my in my conviction. And and I and the tipping point came when I went and looked at China, uh, because you know I'd already established in my early research that you know Silicon Valley had emerged as the center of innovation, not because Stanford was there, not because Berkeley was there, not because it had defense contracts, because all of those types of advantage pertained to Boston as well. Yeah, Boston had MIT, Boston had Harvard, Boston had defense contracts. Um, but what made the Valley distinctive was this risk-taking entrepreneurship, which was made possible and indeed often created by the VCs. VCs are a, sort of a machine for manufacturing courage yeah. because they, they were coming to people and saying, you know, you think you've got an idea, you can do it, don't be frightened, we're gonna help you. You don't have the money, but we're gonna give you the money. You don't have the first five employees, we're gonna get that for you. So I think it, you know, the, the, the reason why the Valley overtook everybody else in terms of innovation in the, around the 1980s was centrally to do with venture capital. And then the reason the Valley maintained that edge uh, right through, let's say, five years ago was because venture capital was, you know, mainly in the Valley. And now venture capital is spreading all around the world. And so innovation is also going to spread around the world. But, but, but then I go to China and I realize that the, the narrative that China's tech sector grew up because the Chinese government wanted it and Chinese government liked it, industrial policies support it. It's simply wrong. I mean, I read that in Kai-Fu Lee's book about AI and I think Kai-Fu is a brilliant guy, but I, I think he's slightly saying what he needs to say to be an operator in China when the government is what the government is there. Um, the reality is that if you go to any of the early Chinese digital companies, whether it's Sina, Sohu, or NetEase, or Alibaba, or Baidu, or Tencent, or, or Ctrip, or whatever you want, they all got US venture investment at the beginning. Yeah. Um, and they got US Silicon Valley lawyers uh, who structured them in a, in, a, in a Silicon Valley kind of way. And that made, for example, you know, it made it possible for Alibaba to use employee stock options to hire the, the best early people that it hired. And so I think, you know, why am I so pro venture capital? It's because I don't believe we would have had Alibaba um, without the employee stock options that brought in the great new first employees. I don't believe Silicon Valley would have been what it was without venture capital. I think this is super important for like building prosperity and innovation and, and even national power, which, in the, you know, I do care about the US ability to defend itself uh, against rivals. And so I think. Venture capital is, you know, for all the warts and the stories about dumping too much money on entrepreneurs or, you know, not having enough diversity. And, you know, there are these legitimate criticisms, but basically it's a force for good. All right. I love it. All right. On that note, thank you, Sebastian Malaby, for joining us on World of Gas. Uh, I follow you on Twitter, SC Malaby on Twitter. Is that the best place for people to, to find out more about you? That's a very good place. Yes. At SC okay. Malaby. All right, I, 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 I think you're a great tweeter, so I highly recommend everyone follow you as well. So thank you again, Sebastian, for joining us. Thank you, Aaron, it's great.